The events of that day were to lead to one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Chapter 9 <sighs> I wish this day never happened. The afternoon was growing pale and Pepper found herself remembering a dream she used to have a lot as a kid. She'd be late for school and have only five minutes before the bell. So she'd hurry out of her house only to notice she'd forgotten her books. So she'd have to go back and fetch them but when she came out again, she'd realize she'd got no clothes on. So she'd have to go back in again and get dressed, but then she wouldn't be able to find her clothes. And when she did, she would keep getting tangled up in them, having to take them off and putting them back on, knowing full well that her five minutes were up. And even when she was finally dressed, she'd run out to catch the school bus, only to remember that she'd left her homework behind. The dream would end only when she woke up. She never got to school, never stopped forgetting stuff, and she never overcame her overwhelming feelings of fear and frustration, frightened of being late for class, but doing her damnedest to get there. Only now, sitting in front of the old mill beside Morgan, Pepper was already awake. It wasn't a dream, but the feelings of fear and frustration were exactly the same. Morgan looked at her and smiled. Everything's going to be all right. He said, and he put an arm around her shoulder, but she pulled away from him. He turned, embarrassed, and looked down at the shoes on his feet, only to see something roll along the ground straight towards them. Whatever it was, it had come through the open doorway of the mill from inside the shadows of the building. Pepper screamed, but Morgan grabbed her forearm, just for a moment, to stop her, to make her look. It was a dirty, busted-up softball. Morgan stepped up to the doorway. It was even darker inside the mill now, but he could see where the ball had come from. Jedediah was sitting on the dilapidated armchair that stood just inside the entrance. The kid was swinging his legs and rubbing his palms against the rotten armrest. Don't ever sneak up on people like that, shouted Pepper. She'd had it with being scared all the time, but sneaking was all Jedediah ever seemed to do when he wasn't poking dead bodies with his stick or asking crazy questions. Now, however, the boy sat still in the armchair. Then, after a suitable pause, he slowly asked, Is your friend really going to have a baby? Christ, he'd even been listening in on their conversations when they first got here. Morgan wasn't cutting Jedediah any more slack. Do a civil favor, kid, and get the hot air. But Jedediah didn't budge. I hope it's a boy. Get out of here! Morgan exploded. He was sick and tired of escapees from the local freak show trying and succeeding to gross him out. What did the little bastard want Aaron to have a boy for, so he could grow up to be a dirty, pathetic moron like him? Jedediah scurried out of the mill, scooping up the softball, only to throw it ahead of himself so he could run after it. He was still playing games, even when being chased off. It was peaceful outside the Hewitt house. Dusk was about an hour away and the wind was easing back, passing like a whisper through the leaves of the trees. Old Monty was round the side of the building where he'd gone to water his small herb garden. As the old man leaned forward in his chair, watering can in hand, his dog scampered playfully under his wheels. 
So far, it had been a good day for the two of them. Just beyond the shinless line cripple, white sheets, bedding, and other laundry billowed from a dozen lines. It was perfect drying weather, and over past the grass filled with the laundry stood a tall barn. Camper! That voice. The old man stopped what he was doing at once, the contented smile dying completely on his tight-lipped face. His dog started to bark. Someone was out there, but old Monty already knew who it was. He remembered her voice. Aaron walked out from round the corner of the brick building. She seemed to be alone. Well, she couldn't have found her fat-mouthed boyfriend, could she? Hi. Smiled Aaron nervously. It's me again. The dog ran forward and yapped at her heels. Truth be told, she wanted to kick the shit out of the hairy little bastard. Old Monty put the watering can down on the ground and wheeled over to find out what, in God's name, she wanted. Andy watched from the cover of the long grass. The idea was that while Aaron distracted the old fart, he'd nip into the house and look for Kemper. It was Aaron's idea. Once they'd all finally sat down and talked everything through, there seemed to be no other solution. The last time she had seen Kemper was out on the porch. He never showed at the mill. He wasn't at the clearing with the wrecked autos, so where else could he be? Another thing. Aaron said there was something suspicious about the old guy. Monty Hewitt didn't seem to care what had happened to Kemper, and Aaron still didn't know what had made that loud noise she'd heard when she'd been stuck with the old man in the bathroom. For all she knew, that bang could have been Kemper. Maybe he was sneaking around the house, or maybe he had had an accident. Either way, the only way they could be certain that Kemper wasn't inside the house was if they went and checked for themselves. There was no point asking the guy in the wheelchair, because if what Aaron had said was true, he seemed downright hostile. And so they'd come up with the plan. Morgan and Pepper had stayed with the van to make sure nothing happened to it. And because they were both too scared to be of much use, while Aaron and Andy investigated. Besides, both Morgan and Pepper had made it perfectly clear that they didn't give a damn about Kemper. Not right now. When Andy was sure that Aaron had the old man's full attention, he gripped hold of the tire iron and then ran quickly across to the entrance of the house. The screen doors and the wooden doors beyond were both unlocked. Andy slipped through into the long central hallway. The polished floorboards creaked beneath his tread. Kemper! He hissed. How to make yourself heard without making any noise, that's a tough one. He tried the living room, but the place was empty. The furniture was still shrouded beneath plastic dust protectors, so he went back out into the hallway and started to try some of the other doors, the creaking floorboards working on his position like some kind of fucking redneck radar. As he passed by an open area underneath the stairs, he spotted a small ornament hanging on the wall. It was a rodent skull with bells all screwy like the shit up at the mill. Other than that, there was nothing else to see. The floor beneath the stairs, like all the boards on the ground floor, was immaculately polished. Trying a few more rooms, he continued down the hallway, until, right near the end of the corridor, he came to the kitchen. It was bizarre. There was no sign of Kemper, but Andy felt strangely compelled to go inside and take a closer look. 
It wasn't the work surfaces, the pots, pans, cooker, or the old-fashioned turn-handle meat grinder standing on the table that caught his eye. None of these things were particularly odd or unusual. What was goddamned odd was the way someone had fastened coil spring bedsteads to the underside of the entire kitchen ceiling. Everywhere Andy looked, the white painted plaster was obscured by bed springs. And what really freaked Andy out was the sight of great hunks of meat hanging down from the springs, the flesh hooked on the ends of the twisted iron coils. He could see beef jerky, cured beef, and other slabs of meat he couldn't quite make sense of. There was no elegance to any of the cuts. They all looked jagged as if someone had just ripped them from the animal carcass. Andy went in and touched one of them. It was a long, narrow piece of meat that could have come from an animal's leg or perhaps its flank. The boy couldn't be sure. But one thing he was sure of, even though he was no butcher, was that meat was usually cross-sectioned into steaks, not cut lengthways like this. Though perhaps cut was too kind of a word to describe how the meat had actually been removed. Surprisingly, because it glistened in the light through the kitchen window, the meat felt dry. Standing in the middle of the kitchen, Andy could hear the faint sound of dripping water. It was the wash basin. A pair of nylon stockings were drip-drying over the enamel basin. Andy went to take a closer look and was disturbed to see that the color of the water coming out of the stockings was pink, even though the nylons themselves were pale brown. It was probably just dye. Everyone knows that if you mix red and green paint, you get brown, right? That's what the tense young man kept telling himself as he turned away from the wash basin to examine the refrigerator standing in the far corner of the room. The refrigerator buzzed, the sound of an electric pump forcing coolant into motion. The whole thing stood taller and wider than a man, like an Art Deco sarcophagus. Andy knew he shouldn't open it. Did he seriously expect to find a blue-faced Kemper inside? But he couldn't resist. The curiosity was just too much. Hell, if the people who lived here thought hanging meat from the kitchen ceiling on bed springs was a good idea, God only knows what they kept in their fridge. Holding firmly onto the crossed metal tire iron, Andy tensed his powerful body and slowly opened the refrigerator door. Nothing, other than a couple bottles of beer, a few bits of food, and a couple jugs of red liquid, soda, cranberry, or something, the fridge was empty. Andy was disappointed. He didn't know what he expected to find in there, but he didn't think it would be so damn normal. He quietly shut the fridge door again. There was an overstuffed suitcase lying on top of the refrigerator with clothes sticking out of the sides. Andy wasn't sure how he hadn't seen it before, but now he knew it was there. He was going to fetch it down and take a look inside. Again, just like the refrigerator, the boy wasn't sure what he hoped to find in the suitcase, but he had to look. There might be a clue, something about Kemper, or maybe even something about the girl who blew her brains out. Gritting his teeth, Andy pressed himself against the front of the refrigerator and stretched out a hand to reach up for the suitcase. There, he could feel the handle on the tips of his fingers. He wasn't quite tall enough. If he could just... It was coming. Suddenly, he had the handle in his grasp and the suitcase came free, unexpectedly jerking loose and pitching forward on top of Andy. Immediately, the case flew open, throwing clothes everywhere. But the clothes had only been in there to provide protective padding for the jars of preserved cherries that were packed tightly inside the case. One by one, the jars fell, glancing off Andy's head, hitting his waving arms, falling clean past him, until one by one they hit the ground and shattered. Shit! The sound of ten glass jars breaking on a cold stone floor was unmistakable and goddamn loud. Aaron had heard the crash of broken glass immediately round by the herb garden at the side of the house. She didn't know exactly where the crashing sound had come from, but she knew it was inside, and she knew it had to be Andy. And for one terrifying moment, it felt like the Kemper thing all over again. Last time, she'd been stuck with the old man in his bathroom. 
Then she'd heard that bang like the pounding of a giant hammer and never saw Kemper again. And here she was, reliving the moments, stuck out here with old Monty, only to hear another great crash. This time it was the breaking of glass. What if the end result was the same? What if she never saw Andy again? His name had barely escaped her lips when Aaron turned and ran back towards the house. Old Monty called after her. Hey, you just can't go in my house. Aaron didn't know if the old man had also heard the noise, and frankly, she didn't give a damn. Once inside, the layout of the place was still engraved in her memory. Aaron ran down the long hallway, trying all the rooms and calling Andy's name, until finally coming to the kitchen right down near the end of the corridor. Oh God, he was laying in a pool of blood. Cherries? At first glance, it had been easy for Aaron to mistake the bright red fruit for something else, something she didn't want to think about. You okay? She asked. Andy looked damn embarrassed. Yeah. He was standing in a mess of fruit and broken glass, not forgetting the scattered clothes in the empty suitcase. But luckily, other than sweat, Andy's clothes seemed pretty dry. The cherry syrup, juice, preservative, or whatever it was, had missed him and spilled out all over the floor. You found him? She asked. Andy shook his head. Suddenly, Aaron saw the bed springs in the ceiling and the torn strips of meat. That was enough for her. She walked out of the room and back into the hallway. Andy followed but found her hesitating in the middle of the corridor. Almost immediately behind them was the storage area and the closed metal door. The one Aaron said had a spyglass in it. Andy saw the battered sliding shutter for the first time, and it was pretty fucking scary. Maybe they should just go down the hall and get out while they could. After all, their plan hadn't exactly gone very well, had it? Old Monty slammed his cane down on the hallway floor. What the hell are you doing in my house? He bellowed. His wheelchair was slam in the center of the hallway, and he was rolling slowly towards them. There was no way they could get past him without a struggle. He was stopping them from leaving. Suddenly and unexpectedly, Andy no longer wanted to leave. He'd had enough of all this bullshit. He was young, strong, and held a tire iron in his clenched fingers. What did this old guy have? No legs from the knee down in the fucking wheelchair? No, it was time to make a stand. Time to find out what the hell was going on once and for all. Andy stepped forward, demanding to know. Where is he? Old Monty stared right back at him, his cold eyes reducing the boy's big man routine to nothing but piss and wind. You ain't run things, boy. Except your mouth. The wheelchair came closer. Old Monty was slowly heading straight at Andy, his very motion challenging the boy, daring him, mocking him. Andy raised the tool. Don't push me, pops. But it was Andy who was breathing fast, not old Monty. It was Andy who was braced with fear and tensing every damn muscle, not old Monty. The old man stopped his wheelchair and laughed. You little turd. He mocked, his voice broken in a deep Texan drawl of ridicule. You're so dead you don't even know it. Aaron stood shoulder to shoulder with the boy. That was the first real threat she'd heard the old man say. Was it because they were trespassing in his house, or was it because- Back off! Shouted Andy, and he brandished the tire iron threateningly. But the old guy wouldn't budge. He wasn't coming closer anymore, but neither was he pulling back. He just sat there a few yards in front of the frightened kids. And if the boy wanted to wave that tool around like that, old Monty lifted his cane and used it to beckon the punk towards him. Come on, boy! He boomed. Bring it! Then he banged the cane down on the polished hallway floor. Instinctively, Andy and Aaron backed up, coming within a foot of that sliding metal door behind them. This was crazy. It was escalating out of control. He didn't want to hit the old man, but... Old Monty brought his cane down again and again, beating a slow, thunderous rhythm on the creaking floorboards. This guy is crazy, said Andy in a nervous aside to Aaron. But she wasn't so sure. Even though Old Monty was practically a silhouette against the light from the screen doors, she could clearly see the rabid, violent glee in the old man's eyes. She couldn't tell if the cripple was crazy or just plain evil. 
he wouldn't stop hitting the floor with his cane. Bang! And laughing. Bang! And threatening. Bang! Over and over. Bang! That damned cane. Andy was gonna have to take him out. He'd either have to push the wheelchair over or hit the old man round the head with the tire iron. He didn't want to. His physique was for girls, not fighting, but there really was no alternative. Aaron was fast reaching the same conclusion. She was out of ideas. The old man was insane. He just kept laughing and banging the floor with the cane. Just kept banging, knocking, and knocking. <laughs> The metal door was thrown open behind them, hitting the wall with a resounding clang, and suddenly their ears were bleeding from the screaming five-horsepower mayhem of a gasoline-fueled engine. Aaron and Andy both jumped on the spot, leaping with fear and turned round to see some kind of ungodly death freak standing in the open doorway. He was huge, his great bulk almost filling the metal frame. He was ugly, like shit straight from the devil's ass. He was wearing a decaying mask sewn up from some poor bastard's face, and he was gripping a fucking chainsaw. Aaron screamed out, Oh my god! Her voice overlapping with Andy's cry of, Holy shit! They couldn't believe what they were seeing, but Aaron immediately knew that this was the answer to all their confusion. Just one second of seeing this skin-wearing psychopath, and almost everything suddenly made bitter, terrifying sense. Andy lifted the tire iron, ready to hit the motherfucker. Then he backed up with Aaron right beside him. The sharp metal teeth went round and round the cutting bar, churning up the air in front of them, roaring, the air thick with the smell of exhaust fumes. The sheer sight of Leatherface almost paralyzed Aaron with fear. Her instinct was to freeze, to put her back up to the wall and do nothing. It was only Andy who kept her going. Andy got ready to run. Maybe the sick bastard was too fat to go after them. One thing was for sure, Andy would never beat him in a fight. They needed help. Quickly, the boy turned to see old Monty laughing his fucking head off behind them. Just ten paces beyond the old bastard was the door. Freedom. Andy grabbed hold of Aaron's hand and ran. At first, the double amputee seemed to be moving out of their way. He pulled his wheelchair back into the side as if to leave the path clear, but he was just getting into position. Andy started to move, one pace, two, and he hit the deck. The boy went crashing down onto the slippery floor of the hallway, the tire iron spinning out of his hand along the polished boards. Andy looked back, the cane, the old fucking bastard had tripped him. Aaron! Closer, closer, closer. The engine never let up, grinding, whining, merciless. When Andy fell, he'd had to let go of Aaron's hand, leaving her to look on in horror as old Monty rolled over and put one of the wheels of his chair directly onto the tire iron, and now the old man was square in her way. She didn't want to look back, but she could hear the chainsaw right behind her. She screamed. Andy tried to get up. He reached for the tire tool, but it was firmly trapped under the wheelchair. Old Monty took a swipe at the boy's head with his cane, but the stick went wide. Aaron could see him, but couldn't believe it. The shambling heap of flesh with a chainsaw squealing in its knotted, stitched apron made from the skin of his victims. The saw buzzing, buzzing, buzzing. She ran forward. Any second now and they'd both be dead. The fighting, the screaming, grappling, shouting, the old man's laughter, the bleeding maniac, Heavy footsteps creaking the floorboards, and everywhere the diving airplane scream of that chainsaw. Andy was going to be killed. He was still wrestling with the tire tool. 
He wasn't looking. He didn't know that the chainsaw blade was heading straight for the flimsy gray cotton undershirt on his back. Aaron couldn't let it happen. The freak had ignored her because she was doing nothing. He just shuffled right past her so that he could take out the biggest threat first, Andy. Suddenly she, ice cold, was struck, white flash, with the realization and shock, visualized Kemper. Kemper and this bastard with the chainsaw. Snarling, she dived forward and clawed at old Monty's groin. She quickly found what she was looking for. She grabbed the old bastard's catheter tube and ripped the fucker right out. Old Monty howled and bent forward in his seat. The chair rocked back and suddenly the tire tool was free. Leatherface was upon them. He grabbed the tire iron and rolled onto his back just as the chainsaw came crashing down. The engine grunted and sparks flew as the boy desperately held the churning blades at bay mere inches from his face. The cutting bar and the tire iron bobbed up and down with each renewed assault and each panic-stricken defense. But Andy couldn't hold out for much longer. Aaron, run! He shouted. She didn't want to leave him, but what other chance would she get? And someone needed to go back to the others and tell them. Then they could fetch the sheriff. If neither Aaron nor Andy made it, then it would just be the Kemper situation all over again. Morgan and Pepper would either get in the van and take off, or they'd come up to the Hewitt place to die. Aaron couldn't allow any of that to happen. With sudden determination, Aaron pushed the whining amputee, his stumpy pants thick with catheter piss, aside and sped down the hallway to the grayish dusk of the screen doors. And finally, she was out. Andy had to time it just right. The tire tool was almost done and any second now, he knew the howling lunatic freak would get into position to finish him. He'd stand over Andy, one foot each side of the boy, then gut him like a pig with the chainsaw. If that bastard had spread his legs over Andy, it would be game over. But Andy had seen the way he moved. He didn't just come at you with the chainsaw. He danced like a friggin' spastic, as if his sweating fat limbs were out of control. He was clumsy, erratic, deranged, stirred hard in the ankle. And suddenly the chainsaw went spinning, tearing a deep gouge through the corridor wall. Round and round and round the engine turned, flinging shards of wood and paper into the air. Andy slid back along the polished floor and out from under the masked freak who had lost his balance, but who was now manhandling the chainsaw back under his insane febrile control. It was now or never. The boy got up and ran like hell. Aaron was long gone by the time Andy hurled the screen door shut behind him. The chainsaw ripped through the screens, tearing the front door into shreds as the lumbering maniac chewed the life out of the damn doorway. Andy sprinted as hard and as fast as he could. He was fit. He should have no problem getting away. But the chainsaw was getting closer. He could hear it. The terrified youth looked back over his shoulder and saw the great heap of flesh filth charging up behind him shambling through the exhaust and squealing like an epileptic death bitch in the gasoline fumes. Just ahead of Andy was a white picket fence. It was near to where Aaron had earlier tried to divert old Monty's attention. He could see all the laundry lines, their crisp white sheets blowing in the wind. Andy vaulted the fence in a single bound. The chainsaw exploded right through the pickets. They ran and in a moment were lost inside the maze of laundry lines. Though firmly built, Andy was still lean and agile. There was no way his pursuer could hope to keep up with him as he ducked and dodged a path through the swaying linen and drying garments. Andy swerved left, he cut right, he ducked under a line, winding a confusing path through the chaotically arrayed barriers of the laundry. The tooth blade drove through the washing like a tornado, ripping and tearing at the cloth like it was saturated flesh. Andy looked back to make sure. Ugh. He had run into a clothesline, the taut fabric rope chopping him in the throat and causing him to fall flat on his back. The line of washing went down with him. Andy was momentarily dazed, cursing his own stupidity. But always, always there was the sound of the chainsaw to remind him of his impending slaughter. Andy tried to get to his feet, but he was all caught up. 
the washing line. Jesus! Somehow he'd gotten mangled and tangled in the fallen laundry. And no, it was just too pathetic. Down low on the ground, Andy could see underneath the billowing laundry. He could see the grass, the trunks of the trees, and two heavy boots and a pair of blood-stained, shit-soiled pants coming straight for him. Andy struggled. The chainsaw turned full throttle and roared. Free! The disentangled boy got up, threw the bastard washing line to the ground, and the engine came screaming, screaming, screaming. Suddenly, the plain white sheets were sprayed with blood, thick red jets showering the washing with droplets. The chainsaw had hacked his left leg off, taking the limb below the knee through sheer, brutal horsepower. Andy cried out and stumbled. He tried to get away, whimpering and throwing his weight, anything to move away from. Reverse kickback from the chainsaw sent the severed leg spinning into Andy's face. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 9 of The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the remake by Stephen Hand. Great job to our voice, uh, our patrons tonight who voice characters. Uh, there's a whole cast list in the description below. You guys are doing a great job. If anybody listening would like to support the channel and get to voice a character each month in an audiobook here on the channel, you can sign up on the Patreon page in the description below. There's a link. Uh, $10 tier and higher gets you the voice roll each month, and there's all kinds of other rewards uh, that come for uh, all the different tiers. Um, yeah, so the book is really picking up steam here. Uh, we got the uh, the severed leg scene. Been looking forward to that one. Uh, got, you know, we got a little more of old Monty. Got a lot of piss and vinegar in that old fucker. Uh, hope you all are enjoying the book as much as I am. I'll be back very soon with more. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and we'll see you next time.